Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hanuma Lopayan. I'm Nargis Farzad. I'm Nargis Farzad from the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics, just across the courtyard. It's an absolute pleasure of mine to be given a tiny little role in this series of uh, Sudovar um, supported and um, funded and initiated um, look at the idea of Iran. This morning we'll be looking at the uh, connections on the northern, north um, western borders and it made me think that uh, you know we are trying to organize immersion opportunities for our students who study Persian where they usually can go to the country where the language is spoken and of course with Iran being out of reach well who has come to our rescue the Yerevan State University, so in Armenia. So the connections are very much alive, even in Russell Square in London. And I, in fact, I think across several uh, universities. It's an absolute honor to invite Professor Huri Berberian, who is a professor of history and the chair of um, uh, Mehruni Family Presidential Chair in Armenian Studies in University of California. Irvine. So I'm not going to read through the blurb of the paper, as I'm sure that will be in the paper. But can I ask you to please invite Professor Berberio to the table. Thank you first uh, to the organizers and sponsors and all those um, behind the scenes who often don't get mentioned but have been uh, doing a great job in bringing us together uh, and also for uh, their hospitality. Uh, and I'm particularly um, happy, uh, obviously, uh, because of the inclusion of um, so many themes uh, around Armenians uh, at this conference. Uh, so I begin here uh, with a painting and a photograph, uh, both by Rajar Armenians of Caucasian background. Uh, to underscore Iranian-Caucasian connections, even in representation. But given my expertise and the task uh, I was given, uh, this will be the first and last time I will refer to them. Um, instead, uh, I will pursue a different kind of idea of Iran, uh, one that is different from uh, the one presented by these image makers. Uh, an idea of Iran that is nevertheless intimately intertwined and connected with its neighbors uh, and often uh, subjects or citizens, that is in particular uh, Armenians and Georgians. In 1940, Iranian historian of the Constitutional Revolution, Ahmed Kasravi, highlighted the skilled experience and multi-ethnic composition of, quote, the Mujahideen Corps, who were composed of the representatives of the Iranian and Caucasian, Georgian and Armenian countrymen, who treated each other in a spirit of fraternity and respect. End quote. In the midst of the Tabriz resistance, toward the end of 1908, against Mohammed Ali Shah's usurpation of the new constitutional regime, Troshak, the Geneva-based Armenian language organ of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, ARF, exclaimed, I quote, the love for freedom has no fatherland. Whosoever is brave and has a heart, the world is open to him. If Armenians have gone to help Sattar Khan as other nationalities, that is the consequence of the same universal historical outlook. Their nationalities have no place, end quote. In August 1910, at the height of internal tensions among revolutionaries and constitutionalists, Georgian revolutionary participant in the Russian Revolution of 1905 and the Iranian Constitutional Revolution and a member of the Menshevik Party, Vlasa Megeladze, Non de Guerre, Tria wrote, I quote, the Persian Revolution worked a miracle. Nations that had been at war with each other for centuries, united in the name of freedom against the common enemy. Persians, Armenians, Georgians, and Jews gathered together under the same flag of revolt. 
The part that Caucasian revolutionaries played in the Persian Revolution is a striking example of fraternal help from one people to another." End quote. His brief remarks, later developed and published as a longer memoir, are often referenced to demonstrate South Caucasian and Iranian co collaboration and the role of Armenians and Georgians in the Constitutional Revolution through the commitment of fighters, expertise in bomb making, transfer of weapons, and dissemination of socialism. Armenians and Georgians had extensive experience in revolutionary and combat activity, whether in the Russo-Japanese War, the Russian Revolution of 1905, or the armeno azeri clashes of the same year. Based on, uh, based on research primarily in Armenian language original sources and my own scholarship for the Armenian case and the scholarship of others in the Georgian case, this paper focuses on the Armenian example and draws upon the Georgian one to highlight the Caucasian-Iranian connections. It emphasizes the role of Armenians and Georgians in connecting Iran and the South Caucasus through their role as trans-imperial figures, whether educators, activists, and revolutionaries, crisscrossing Russian and Rajar imperial frontiers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The episode of Irano-Caucasian collaboration during the Constitutional Revolution is undoubtedly the most recognized and even celebrated aspect of the role of Armenians and Georgians in generating and sustaining Irano-Caucasian connections. But these 19th, 20th century connections have a deep and long history of Armenian and Georgian presence in an engagement with Iran from antiquity. Please bear with me as I draw atten to attention to some of the most important earlier connections and contacts that culminated in the influence, influential role of Armenians and Georgians in the Iranian Constitutional Revolution. Ties between Iran, Armenia, and Georgia go as far back as the third millennium, when Northwest Iran, Southern Georgia, and Armenia constituted what Dave, David Lang called a single cultural zone. The South Caucasus, he and others have argued, was, quote, a bone of contention for much of its history, either between Iran and Rome, or later, Iran and the Ottoman and Russian empires. What Fatima Sudava Fahman Fahmoyan has revealed for the Georgian case, that, quote, the very geography of Georgia dictated a game of musical chairs between several worlds, end quote, may be equally applied to Armenia. Similarly, what Nina Garsoyan has pointed out for the Armenian case may be useful for the Georgian one. Quote, from antiquity, Armenia's geographical position at the meeting point of Greco-Roman and Iranian worlds created a situation that favored the country's cultural life, enriched with two major traditions, but playing havoc with the, country, with the continuity of its political history. As a general pattern, therefore, Armenia flourished only when the contending forces on either side were in near equilibrium and neither was in a position to dominate it entirely. Thus, while imperial contest over Armenia and Georgian, Armenian and Georgian lands led to much political instability, in both cases, we see, as Garcian demonstrated for Armenian case, the strong links with Iranian cultural elements. After all, the first mention of Armenia and Armenian is in Achaemenid King Darius's 518 BCE inscription at Behistun. Armenian and Georgian ruling elite were intimately bound to Iran through blood and marital ties to the extent that even Saint Gregory the Illuminator, who converted the Armenian king to Christianity early in the fourth century and led the Christianization of Armenia, descended from a Parthian nobleman and is known as Grigor Bartev. Gregory the Parthian. Both Armenian and Georgian monarchies were intimately connected with the Parthians or Arsacids, whose male family members sat on not only the Iranian, but also Armenian and Georgian thrones. With official state conversion to Christianity by the Armenian and Georgian monarchies in the early fourth century, a calculated move to resist absorption by Iran and retain a distinct identity, led the centuries of conflict 
led to centuries of conflict under the Sasanians trying to impose Zoroastrianism on both states. Both Armenians and Georgians tried to play the ruling powers of Rome and Iran against each other, often, un, often successfully, and even rebelled in the fifth century, although in that case with unsuccessful results. In the sixth century, Sasanian tolerance of Christians ameliorate, ameliorated the situation to such a point that the last Marsban of Armenia, Varastiros II Bakarni, was educated at the palace of Khosrov II at Ctesiphon. Arab rule disrupted the cultural contacts between Iran and the South Caucasus, only resuming in the 19th century. In this period, too, the Bakradid dynasty, whose different lines ruled over Armenia and Georgia, had its roots in Iran, with the Armenian Bakradids being the designated coronet family of the Armenian Arsacids. What Cyril Tumanov uh, calls possibly the, quote, the most important princely dynasty of Caucasia attained kingly status in the 19th century and retained, in Georgia, retained it in Georgia to the 19th, unquote. The Georgian Bakradids reached the pinnacle of their power under Queen Tamar a century after the Armenian Bakradids had ceased to rule on the Armenian plateau. Queen Tamar's use of armeno georgian armies yet again reveals the entangled Armenian and Georgian histories despite important de deviations and ruptures as in the seventh century rift between the churches. Connections are also clearly evident in language. As Middle Persian loanwords and, and proper names entered the Armenian and Georgian languages, mainly directly, uh, from Iranian, although some were transmitted to Georgian through Armenian. Religious, administrative, military, and daily life linguistic borrowings abound. Administrative and military vocabulary and terminology, terminology indicate the extent to which Armenians model themselves after the Parthians, including the distinct centrifugal Nahtabar or Naharar social structure. While loanwords survive, Iranian elements in art and architecture decrease with Christianization of Armenia and Georgia. Although indigenous populations of Armenians and Georgians, along with other Christians, Zoroastrians, Jews, and Hindus, existed in Iran, it was the Safavids in particular, in particular Shah Abbas, who brought Armenians and Georgians back into the Iranian fold in the 17th century through three channels. First, the establishment of the Golam Corps of Caucasians, including Armenians and Georgians, which became the mainstay of the empire's military and administration. Second, the predominance of the, uh, the excuse me, the prominence of the royal harem, which comprised Caucasian women, many of them Georgian, of Georgian origin, who played a crucial role in court politics. And third, the forcible transfer of Christian populations uh, among, uh, including Armenians and Georgians, numbering in the hundreds of thousands, from the Ottoman and Russian Empire from the border to Iran by Shah Abbas, although the earlier transfer or earlier transportations, transplantations took place under Shah Tahmas. Among those relocated by Shah Abbas were Armenian merchants with commercial know-how and global contacts and their families who were settled in the new capital, Isfahan. While Georgians converted and assimilated during the centuries to come, Armenians maintained, for the most part, their ethno-religious identity and were supplemented in the late 19th and early 20th centuries by refugee populations fleeing massacres, genocide, and Sovietization. According to Sudaba Fahman Fahman, quote, the integration of Georgian nobility into the highest spheres of Safavid administration enhanced the already well-entrenched cultural ties to Iran and intensified cultural interaction, end quote. Revived relations and connections between Safavid Iran, Armenians, and Georgians took a turn within decades of Rajar ascendancy when a number of wars between Rajars and, and the Rajars and the Romanovs concluded with the Russian annexation of all Caucasian territories under Rajar, under Iranian rule, today's Armenia, Azerbaijan, Dagestan, Georgia, with the 1813 Treaty of Golestan and the 1828 Treaty of Turkmenchai 
although Kartli and Kakheti had been incorporated into the Russian Empire uh, in 1801. The transfer of Iranian Caucasian territories led to the emigration of tens of thousands from Iran and signaled a shift in irano armeno georgian connections. In the Georgian case, as George Sanikitze explains, relations became primarily of an, quote, economic nature, as Georgia and its capital had gradually become a transit route of Iranian goods entering Europe and Russia and vice versa, unquote. Second, they involved the transmission of Western European and Russian ideas culture and technological innovation through Georgia to Iran. And third, Irano-Georgian connections benefited from a socially and culturally active group of Iranians in Tiflis, Tbilisi, who, quote, comprised the largest Muslim community, end quote. The Tiflis Iranian community was made up of merchants, artisans, and other workers, and even had a charity organization, the Persian Charitable Society. According to Iago Gochileshvili, and quote, an insider of the Iranian constitutional revolution, Sergo Gagoshidze, also underlines the particularly active role of the Iranians of the Caucasus, namely Iranian merchants in Tbilisi, in recruiting Caucasian volunteers for their participation in the resistance in Iran, end quote. Iranian-Caucasian connections were facilitated in the late 19th, early 20th centuries by what soci sociologist David Harvey has called time-space compression. That is, a period of significant shifts in technologies of global communication and transportation that seem to, quote, make the world smaller, time shorter, and life faster, end quote. I admit this is a quote from me. Um, that's supposed to make you laugh. Anyway. <laughs> Harvey explains, and this is his quote, the expansion of the railway network accompanied by the advent of the telegraph, the growth of steamship, steam shipping, and the building of the Suez Canal, the beginnings of radio communication, and bicycle and automobile travel at the end of the century, all changed the sense of time and space in radical ways. This period, this period also saw the coming on stream of a whole series of technical innovations New technologies of printing and mechanical reproduction allowed a, a dissemination of news, information, and cultural artifacts throughout ever broader swaths of the population. End quote. And, so, and some yesterday had, so, uh, had already have already referred uh, to to these advancements in transportation led to a railway system that, by the early 20th century, linked Poti, Batumi, Bali, Kafkas, Tiflis, and Baku. Railway construction in general saw a 75% increase in mileage in the early 20th century. By 1905, the Transcaucasian Railway connected Baku with Batumi, operating almost parallel to the Vladikavkaz Railway to the south of the main Caucasus range, with branches from Tiflis to Alexandropol, Gumri, north of Yerevan, and then to Tars, Yerevan, Jufa, and on to the Iranian-Russian Iranian frontier. As J.N. Westwood points out, quote, Russian uh, engineers and capital also bi bi li built lines in Turkey and Persia connecting with the Russian railways, end quote. The dramatic transformations in technologies of transportation and communicability, that is time-space compression, and the consequent changes brought about by them are crucial for understanding the South Caucasus as a densely connected, compressed space from where cultural and intellectual developments and revolutionary ideas and activists flowed and circulated into neighboring regions, especially, most especially, Iran. The railway system increased the movements and encounters between South Caucasians and Iranians with one another and with new ideas, and ultimately helped, quote, stimulate communicability, end quote, as, the, as then Russian finance minister Georg von Kankin surmised rather fearfully. He didn't like communicability. <laughs> Consequently, this environment became conducive to collaboration and resistance during the Iranian Constitutional Revolution. For example, the British War Office reported, quote, four wagon loads of revolutionaries, end quote, crossing by rail from the South Caucasus to Resh and Dilan, as well as traveling by steamer and conventional routes. 
Russia's intelligence agency, Okhrana, reported, quote, every day volunteer detachments from the Caucasus arrive in Tabriz, which then make common cause with the Persian revolutionary detachments. Tabriz is waiting for the arrival of new detachments. The majority of the volunteers are Armenians from Enizapetko province. There are also Tatars, he's talking about uh, Azerbaijani Turks, and Georgians among the ranks, end quote. In the Armenian case, monasteries, like the St. Thaddeus Monastery in northwestern Iran, and family homes provided sanctuary for revolutionaries and arsenals or transfer points for weapons. The mobility of Armenians and Georgians, like that of others, was facilitated by rather fluid imperial borders. Although written permissions or passports were required according to an 1844 Iranian-Russian or Russo-Iranian agreement, they were not strictly enforced. Starting in the late 19th century, Iran's Armenian community, numbering quite a small, actually, number compared to their Ottoman and Russian um, counterparts, numbering around 70,000, began to experience an influx of political activists and teachers, both men and, uh, both men and women, from the South Caucasus. In fact, revolutionaries often appeared in Iran as teachers and principals in newly established schools. Though through their impact and primarily, in, primarily the efforts of Irano-Armenian Irano women's organizations concerned with the advancement of women and the influence of missionary uh, instruction, schools, especially girls' schools, dotted Irano-Armenian communities in the early 20th century. These Irano-Armenian women's organizations founded in Tehran as early as 1871 were Iran's first women's organizations and modeled after Armenian ones in Tiflis. Unlike other networks uh, with maps like this one, uh, women's networks still lack their own map, uh, but perhaps not for long. Through their activism for girls' education, women began to enter the public arena, negotiating and interacting with not only other women, but men at different levels of authority, from Armenian school boards of trustees, trustees and clergymen, to Lajar authorities, in order to push their agenda forward. <clears throat> Armenian revolutionaries contributed militarily and ideolo ideologically to the Constitutional Revolution, while women collaborated with their Muslim counterparts to support constitutionalism and women's education and advancement, and even tended to wounded Iranian and Caucasian constitutionalist fighters. When over 50,000 refugees and victims of the Hamidian massacres of 1894-96, of World War I, of genocide, and of so Sovietization bled into Iran, women's organizations came to their aid. These endeavors and their activism for girls' education facilitated women's entry into the public arena as they gain credibility and visibility as, pub as public advocates of rights and responsibilities, both within the Armenian community and larger Iranian society. <laughs> Activists and revolutionaries also took advantage of the telegraph, which permeated Iran and the Caucasus by the late 19th century. Iranian telegraphy also employed foreigners, particularly British and minorities, especially Armenians, who were, quote, often fluent in both English and Persian, end quote. In Iran, as the Ottoman and Russian empires, the telegraph became both an instrument of government control and Iranian, British, and Russian intelligence gathering and opposition. Tabriz, the nucleus of opposition in the Constitutional Revolution, was also the center of telegraphy in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Telegraphy became a target of strikes and offices became places of refuge. That's Armenian revolutionaries were among many telegraph users who used codes of letters and numerals to send telegrams within Iran, to and from Iran and the South Caucasus and Europe. To organize and coordinate actions and disseminate news or propaganda during the Constitutional Revolution. Irano-Caucasian connections also involved money transfers through the revolutionary network, as well as the inflow of Armenian language newspapers, 
from Tiflis and Baku, although, the 1908, in, although 1908, uh, in 1908, or after 1908, excuse me, the number of periodicals published in the South Caucasus decreased substantially in large part because of the Stolotin crackdown on revolutionaries and their activities in the South Caucasus. Armenians and Georgians continued, however, to bring in periodicals from Iran. For example, Georgian Sergo Ochonikitze, in addition to gun running, organized, quote, the distribution of Bolshevik literature through Iran in 1909, end quote. Caucasian, Armenian, and Georgian papers closely followed the revolution, discussed Iran's political and economic situation, and published eyewitness and participant accounts and correspondence. The Iranian revolutionary period of 1905 to 1911 marked the zenith of Irano-Caucasian connections, circulation and collaboration among the Iranians and South Caucasians. Iranian constitutionalists received arms and fighters from the South Caucasus, as hundreds of Armenians, Azeris, and Georgians fought against royalist forces and Russian troops, successfully reinstating in 1909 the constitutional regime which had been aborted by Mohammed Ali Shah in 1908. These Caucasian revolutionaries, along with Iranian workers, returning from jobs in the oil refineries of Baku, also became important conduits in the transfer of socialist ideas and labor organization that influenced Iranian revolutionaries. As Gochile Shvili demonstrates, these workers were, quote, a live and mobile link that connected Tbilisi, Baku, Tabriz, and Rasht revolutionary groups, end quote and thus must be considered another crucial aspect of Irano-Caucasian connections. Armenian political parties like the ARF, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, and the Hanchakyan Party work closely with Tabriz Majlis delegate Sayyid Hassan Tariz Tarizadeh, while two former Hanchakyan Party members, Veram Pilosyan and Setrak Pangoyan, no pic there, no photos of them anywhere, helped found the Democrat Party. Armenian and Georgian revolutionaries especially were motivated by a number of factors, including most especially opposition toward Russian oppression and exploitation, which victimized not only Caucasians, but also Iranians, and a commitment to international socialism with the Iranian revolution for them serving as an initial step. Similar to the ARF and the Chakyan party, according to Gojale Shvili, Tiflis and Batumi social democrats became active participants in the movement from the beginning of the Tabriz resistance in Tabriz resistance and participated in revolutionary activities in Azerbaijan, Gilan, and Tehran, quote, constituting one of the most effective and important military corps among the revolutionary forces, end quote. The participation of Armenians and Georgians was not limited to fighting but involved theoretical or, or, or ideological, largely social democratic influence, especially in the case of Georgians, such as Guji Sergo, uh, which is the nom de guerre of Sergo Gamgishlili, who were, quote, more radical than their Iranian and Armenian counterparts and included Menshevik social democrats, Bolsheviks, uh, social revolutionaries, and anarchists. In the Armenian case, the main ideological influence came from Armenian social democrats, such as Veram Pilosyan. The Nchagyan party even translated its social democratic program into Persian with the collaboration of K. Ostovan, uh, who is Hossein Muhtamed, and leading Hanchak theoretician Grigory Yerikyan, himself of Ottoman origin, so there's another connection there uh, that goes to the Ottoman Empire. Further cooperation between Hunchaks and Iranian Social Democrats led to the creation in early 1911 of a solely Iranian branch of the Hunchagyan Party, which, according to Yerikyan, at the behest of Iranian members, dropped the non-Persian term Hunchagyan and became merely, merely Iranian Social Democratic Party. Now, connections went beyond uh, those between Armenian Georgians and uh, Iranians, of course, and included, as Mangold Bayat uh, and others have shown, collaboration between Tiflis and Baku Social Democratic Committees and Caucasian Azeris, such as uh, Hemat Party leaders Nariman Naimov and Amin Masuzadeh, 
who at the request of Haidar Khan Amori, uh, Amori who was known as, quote, the bomb maker, uh, raised funds to purchase weapons uh, and others like Bulgarian Russian subject named Panov. Haidar Khan served as a significant link connecting Caucasian radicals to the Constitutional Revolution. He himself was Iranian born uh, in the province of Azerbaijan, but had gone to live in the South Caucasus. He received his education in Yerevan and Tiflis, uh, so Armenian and Georgian connection, um, joined Muslim Armenian uh, and Georgian socialists, worked in Baku, Azeri connection, uh, took part in the Constitutional Revolution back in Iran, and worked closely with both Iranians and South Caucasians. Talk about cosmopolitan. Uh, he also collaborated uh, with Yeprem Khan, uh, who himself led a militia of Armenian and Georgian fighters. Uh, and here are some postcards um, uh, reminding me of, of, of yesterday's uh, talk by uh, Mia. So Bayat demonstrates, quote, a common short-term goal uh, the overthrow of Mohammed Ali Shah, forge an alliance of disparate Caucasian, Armenian, and Iranian groups. Calling themselves Mujahideen or Fedayan, they were radical secular fighters with ties to Baku, Tiflis, and Tabriz, who more often than not distrusted the other, one another. End quote. Moritz Deutschmann emphasizes the differences between the Caucasian and Iranian revolutionary actors regarding, quote, practices of political violence, the question of centralized state authority, as well as the ambivalence of the role of trans-Caucasian Muslims in addition to an idea of superiority and civilized agency, end quote, on the part of Caucasian revolutionaries. All of which, he says, points to a subtle division between Caucasian and Iranian activists in the context of the Iranian Constitutional Revolution. <coughs> These divisions, Bayat further explains, had another dimension, end quote. The Iranian Democrats generally wished to downplay their political ties with non-Muslim Armenians, while Armenians grew more skeptical and distrustful of the Iranian political allies and comrades in arms, end quote. Thus, the sometimes violent Iranian inter-party struggle between Democrats and moderates that reigned in 1910 and facilitated the victory of external and internal anti-constitutionalist forces a year later was accompanied by the breakdown of relations among Iranians and South Caucasians during the revolution. <laughs> but despite expected divergences, even at times acrimony, the uniqueness of the Iranian constitutional revolutionary movement in the history of the region and in bringing Armenians, Azerbaijanis, Georgians, and Iranians together in common cause cannot be denied. Of particular significance and the topic of this presentation has been the Armenian and Georgian role in the development and cultivation of Irano-Caucasian connections during, during especially but not exclusively the constitutional period perhaps best symbolized not only in lived struggle, but also in death. The quote, the Georgian's fraternal graveyard in the Armenian church in Tabriz, the heart of anti-autocratic resistance. For, Armenian, for Armenians and Georgians, the idea of Iran, one can say, was the promise of a better future. Understanding and recognizing the role of Iran's ethno-religious minorities, sometimes dismissed or erased, are crucial to appreciating Iran and the idea of Iran at the cusp of modernity. Thank you. It is wonderful that we can welcome Dr. Alexandre Jabbari, who will speak about Bozgasht and after conceptions of Iran in a literary context. Dr. Jabbari is assistant professor in the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Minnesota. He works on literature, history, philology of the Middle East and South Asia. 
His first book, The Making of Persianate Modernity, Language and Literary History Between Iran and India, was just published by uh, 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 Cambridge University Press just under a year ago. And it's um, wonderful to, of, I don't know, obviously I don't know the content of your paper, but of course this is again an era of monarchs who uh, dab hands at composing poetry, the divan of Fat Ali Shah himself, and many uh, poets who matter so much to this day, a notable one, and I think many Persian speakers here would know the beginning of Mardan Khoda, Mardan Khoda, and um, that matters very much to this day. So can I please ask you to invite Dr. Jaffa into the program. Thank you, Nargis, for that kind introduction. Um, and after that, I'm, I'm, I have to say, I'm not actually, despite the title, really going to get into the Bosgash data, the literary return. Um, but some other literary developments in the period that have received uh, a bit less attention. Uh, so in this paper, I'll offer uh, a view from the South, uh, highlighting the idea of Iran in Indian texts, especially Urdu language texts, uh, but also uh, in interaction between Iranians and Indians uh, in the Hajar period. Uh, now, there are two larger cosmopolitan others against which a nascent Iranian identity begins to define itself in the 19th century. Uh, one is, of course, Islam, which is conceived of, or starts to be conceived of, uh, as closely bound up with Arabic and the Arabs, and, and much of the scholarship on early Iranian nationalism has focused on how intellectuals like Mirza Fatawi Ahun Zabeh or Mirza Agha Khan Kermani uh, articulated a vision of Iranian identity in opposition to uh, Arabic and, and the Arabs rejecting be belonging to a larger Ummat or Muslim community uh, in favor of a nationally defined community. But more recent scholarship has also begun to consider how Iranian national identity is also being carved out of a larger Persianate cosmopolis, the world of Persian letters uh, far beyond the borders of Iran. Uh, and that's where I'll focus my attention today, especially on India, which was historically a center of Persian literary production. So I argue that the logic of nationalism uh, is, is bolstered not only by uh, developments uh, in Iran, especially around the Constitutional Revolution, uh, but also by developments in India uh, as well. And that this really came to shape how people envisioned the relationship between Persian literature and Iran. Iranians increasingly asserted a central role in the world of Persian letters. This is not something that was uh, taken for granted, or was the case before. And that role is being worked out uh, largely uh, in the transition from writing in the genre of, of Tazkide, these kind of traditional biographical uh, anthologies or, or dictionaries of poetry, to writing in a modern genre of literary history, texts that you know, identify themselves as Tarikh you know, Adabiyat Iran, the history of the, the literature of Iran. Uh, and this was a, the process in, in transitioning between these genres that uh, Iranians, but also Indians uh, and Europeans uh, participated. Uh, so I'll also trace out a little bit of that transition uh, in this talk. But let me begin uh, with the historic place of Persian in India before the rise of nationalist thinking. Uh, for centuries, Persian had been the most widely used language of uh, governance and, and, uh, and learning across India where it was not necessarily thought of as connected to Iran. It was spread and patronized and used by uh, people of different ethnic, linguistic, uh, religious, geographic uh, origins. Its, its use was not dominated by anything like what we would today call uh, native speakers. In fact, there's not really such an idea of, uh, of a native speaker uh, until the 19th century. And so instead, Persian was dominated by anyone who really mastered the language. And you can take, for an example, uh, the Indian Muslim literateur uh, Sadajud, Sadajuddin Ali Khan Arazu. Um, for, for him, the, the people of the language, Ahl Zaban, are not necessarily those who speak the language in the home. 
uh, Ahl Zaban are those who master the language, the higher register of the language through poetic cultivation. Uh, and this we can see reflected in his own confidence in his command over Persian to such an extent uh, that he writes a work, Tanbih al Ghafilin, um, criticizing and correcting uh, the poetry of the Iranian uh, Hazin al Lahiji. And he goes over hundreds of lines of poetry and says, you know, this is not the right image, this is not the right language. Um, and, and he defends Indian poets against uh, Hazin's criticisms. So here's an Indian who has every confidence in his Persian, from the level of poetic diction down to the most granular level of phonology. So in another work, in his Tazkire, Majma Nafa'is, he mocks these divergent aspects of Iranian Persian phonology, things like you know, rendering ah as oo before nasal, so you get zabun instead of zabon, this kind of thing. Um, you know, he, he, he makes fun of it, and in, in a way, he would be right to sense that the Indo-Persian that he was familiar with retained older aspects of Persian phonology. Uh, you know, things like maintaining a, a difference between qaf and ghain in pronunciation, uh, or ma maintaining the majhul vowels, the, the, the long... Uh, Okay, slide of this. The long O in, in Bo that is now pronounced Bu in, um, in, in, in much of Iran, or words like um, what was originally Omed that becomes Omid in Western dialects, like most Iranian dialects. So these are all kind of maintained uh, in Indo-Persian and in Urdu. Um, so, so again, he, he has a kind of uh, sense that he and Indians more, more broadly are the, if you like, the, the authentic users of this, of this language. That it's not something that is inherently essentially tied to Iran and Iranians have the true command over. But over the course of the 19th century, we see a loss of self-confidence in the Indo-Persian tradition uh, such that by the end of the century, Indians came to accept the authority of Iranians over the Persian language, whether in poetry or in pronunciation. And you can see this uh, in 19th century shifts in Indo-Persian and Urdu pronunciation. So words like um, that would have been pronounced Omeid um, come to be pronounced Omid also in Urdu, also in Indo-Persian. We see this um, in poetry, you start to get a rhyme for example, between um, omid and deed, like saw, uh, something that would have been impossible with the older uh, you know, pronunciation when the, when the majhul vowel, that, that uh, different vowel is being maintained there. Uh, and this reflects a nationalist logic that Persian is attached to Iran, so the way that Persian is being spoken in Iran must be correct, must be authentic, as opposed to the Indian pronunciation, which again, is in fact the more sort of um, historically you know, conservative one. Okay, so what's, what's behind this shift? Um, oh. um, it's of course the British. Um, the, the British East India Company uh, initially continued patronizing Persian, uh, much as the Mughals uh, had done before them. Uh, but British support for Persian learning uh, began to erode uh, first uh, in 1832, limited to you know, Bombay presidency, Madras presidency, then further in 1837 in, in, uh, in Bengal, uh, and then really after the 1857 uh, uh, revolt against uh, company rule, um, which, was, which was violently suppressed, but then also provoked this moment of kind of uh, soul-searching uh, on behalf of the British. Where did we go wrong? How did something like this happen? How, why did the Indians rise up against us? Well, it's because we've lost touch with the common man, because we've ruled through this literary language that is a foreign language. It's a language that belongs to Iran. It's not really the language of the, of the local people. Uh, and so there was therefore a shift to rule through what were deemed vernacular languages, uh, like Urdu and, and many others. Um, now, of course, that's, that's the, the British thinking. This, the Indians who were users of Persian had no such qualms about this. And in fact, there was a lot of resistance um, from Indian uh, Hindus, from Kayasts, from castes that um, had you know, been dominant in, um, in using Persian as scribes and, and munshis and so on, uh, really resisted this shift. 
Um, so it's not really something that is kind of organically driven, like a, a demand of, of people on the ground, uh, but instead it, it reflects um, uh, British thinking about um, language, this, this kind of Herderian uh, idea uh, or understanding of the nation as, as an organic unity between language, land, people, religion, all forming a sort of neat whole. And then that idea is being reified uh, in, in new policies like this shift away from Persian into uh, vernacular languages. So as a result, uh, patronage for Persian literary tradition uh, in India declines, uh, though as I've argued elsewhere, it doesn't actually disappear uh, as it's often uh, thought to. Uh, and Indians come to internalize this nationalist thinking around language. So by the late 19th century, Indian Muslims accepted and even contributed to an Iran-centric paradigm of Persian literary history. Again, despite the fact that India had been such a center for Persian literary production. I mean, in sheer volume, had, had been producing more Persian literature uh, than somewhere like Iran. Uh, so this is relevant not just to India, uh, but to Iran as well, because Indians come to adopt and reproduce the logic which holds Iran to be the center uh, of, uh, of Persian language and literature. And as they do, they reinforce uh, a burgeoning sense of Iranian national identity, which positions Iranians as the heirs to the, the Persian tradition. Uh, and so this kind of reinforcement then is happening in interactions uh, between Iranians and Indians, of which there's quite a lot in, in the British, uh, sorry, in the, in the Fajr period. Um, so thanks to um, uh, Talim Grigor and, and many others, we know, uh, we know a good deal about these uh, connections between Iranians and uh, Indian Zoroastrian reformers um, like uh, Manik Jilinji Hatariya, the Parsi reformer uh, who was active in Iran in the second half of the 19th century. Um, but it, in fact, because we've had in the, in the past couple of decades such a great deal of attention to and, and wonderful scholarship on this community, on connections between Iranians and Indian Zoroastrians, uh, we've actually overlooked uh, the role of uh, non-Zoroastrian Indians um, in uh, this sort of broader project of, uh, of reform and modernization that's going on. And so Indian Muslims uh, have been kind of overlooked here, and, uh, and that's something that I want to highlight. So we can take, uh, we, can, we can add alongside uh, someone like Hatariya, um, the Indian Muslim literary historian and scholar Muhammad Hussein Azad, <laughs> Uh, who in 1885 traveled by steamship uh, to Iran in order to acquire books and gather materials for uh, a Persian dictionary he was going to write and, and never completed, uh, but he did write a literary history of Persian, and he wrote a, a study, Banda Parsi, of um, the contemporary um, Iranian Persian language, uh, which is, which is uh, an interesting thing to look at elsewhere. Um, but during his travels in Iran, uh, Azad met a number of uh, Iranian merchants who had spent time working in British India, but he also met with prominent intellectuals, uh, literary and uh, political figures. So he was running in these same sort of um, uh, prominent and elite circles um, that some of these uh, prominent Parsi reformers were as well. So this included, you know, meeting people like Ali Ghuli Khan Mukhbar Dole, Minister of Education. Um, the literary historian Mohammed Hossein Fourouri, uh, who I'll, I'll come back to in a bit. In fact, we can, uh, we can add him here. Um, the Iranian uh, consular to, uh, to the Ottomans uh, and others. And while he was in Tehran, so he travels, he starts, um, uh, of course, in the south because he's, he's arrived by uh, steamship, but he travels throughout the country. And when he gets to Tehran, he's really moving in these reformist circles. He's spending time actually with Hatariya. Uh, he visits the Darul Funun. And he's not a unique figure in this regard. There's this real, uh, because of the new um, technology as well as overland infrastructure, you know, railroad that, uh, that we've heard about um, just now and, and earlier yesterday, um, there's a real kind of growing exchange um, and, and growing number of Indian travelers. Again, not just Zoroastrians, Indian Muslim travelers um, in Iran in the period. You have 
um, you know, the formation of kind of uh, anti-imperialist um, networks between constitutional revolutionaries uh, and, uh, and Indian nationalists, um, Indian uh, Muslim reformers like the All India Muslim League um, forming connections with Iranians. Um, we know, of course, from earlier scholarship about um, Iranian newspapers being um, published in India, Hablur Matin in, in Calcutta, for example. We have the opposite as well. We have Indian Muslim Urdu newspapers like uh, Peshwa, um, whose editors take refuge in Iran um, because of their anti-British activities. And, and then, of course, we have um, you know, these kind of itinerant Islamist figures like Jamaluddin al-Afghani, who are circulating between uh, Iran and India, and, and I, could, I could go on, I could give other examples in the Q&A if there's interest. Um, Tati Zadeh, who we just heard about, um, forged ban uh, bonds with, uh, with the Ghadar um, anti-nationalist, uh, anti-colonial party in, uh, in India, for example. Um, so there's, there's really a, a great deal of this kind of, uh, uh, as I say, interaction. Uh, now that I've demonstrated, hopefully, the, the significance of these connections between Iranians and Indian Muslims, let me turn to that transition uh, that I mentioned earlier from writing Tazkides to writing literary histories, which was really, again, a shared Indo-Iranian project. Um, oh, I forgot to show, uh, this is um, Mohammed Hossein Azad's uh, travelogue that he writes while, while traveling in, um, in Iran, which is my source for knowing about who he's met with and, and so on. So the genre of literary history, uh, again, as a, a genre onto itself, emerges in this period as a way of articulating new national identity. You know, who is the Iranian people? What is their history? Well, it's a literary history. It's a history that we know through literature. It's a history of, of language, of, of poetry. Um, but it's also a site, the uh, literary history is a site for developing also just new prose styles, new sense of historiography, um, uh, new values, and to illustrate that, I think it's uh, it's useful to um, pair a couple of representative texts that are kind of on the margins of this transition uh, from Tazkida to literary history, which again, that, that transition is being worked out in exchange between uh, Iranians and Indians and Europeans. Uh, so we can begin with Reza Khuli Khan Hedayat's um, Majma al-Fosaha, Assembly of the Eloquent, um, and Hedayat, of, of course, is a uh, 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 statesman who, uh, whose life also kind of is, mirrors that kind of transition. You know, he's a, he's a man of letters in the Qajar court, but also in the Darul Funun, this, this modern educational institution. Tutors, shahs, and crown princes, composes poetry. Um, and his, um, his task is all, often identified as kind of the last Persian Tazkira. It's commissioned first by Muhammad Shah uh, and later by Nasiruddin Shah, completed in 1871. The text is structurally conservative. That is to say, it's, it's structured in the traditional Tazkira format, which is these kind of separately bounded entries, like dictionary entries, like encyclopedia um, entries. Um, but what is innovative here is that in his preface, he brings in Zand and Avesta. Uh, knowledge of uh, pre-Islamic um, uh, Iranian uh, languages and texts that are, pro are probably informed by his contact with um, Hatariya um, and, and by the, the, the sort of early uh, reception of, uh, of European Orientalist philology as well. Uh, and so this is a, a really brief thing that he does here, but it's totally unprecedented uh, in this um, Tazkida tradition to be bringing in languages other than um, Persian, and pre-Islamic languages in particular, and placing them in the same trajectory as Persian. So this small move um, is, is really kind of um, paves the way for uh, later texts that will really take up that project and, and in a much more significant way incorporate Old Persian and Middle Persian and other languages into the story of uh, Persian literature and the story of, of, uh, of Iran. So this paves the way for these kind of modern uh, nationalist literary histories. Uh, and so this genre of modern literary history then is, 
is generically unprecedented in incorporating all of these other disciplines, you know, bringing in uh, literary criticism, bringing in philology, lexicology, alongside history uh, and biography, uh, all in, 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 this sort of, in the same text, in the same genre. Um, okay, so as I, as I said, then they start to in, in, incorporate you know, develop a paradigm of Iranian national literature, not just the poets of a particular court or just uh, or Persian poetry altogether, but really a, an Iranian uh, literary tradition that, that goes beyond New Persian altogether. Um, interestingly, then, the Indian literatures who are also writing literary histories of Persian did not challenge this Iran-centric model of Persian literary history, nor did they suggest a kind of Indian national literature in which Persian could be included or, or, or be a part of. But instead, they elevated Iran's place even in their own literary histories. In fact, they sometimes even shared and underscored their Iranian contemporaries, their prejudices against the Persian literature of, of South, uh, South Asia. Uh, so the Indian scholars, um, Muhammad Hossein Azad, whom, whom I mentioned, and Shibli Nomani, both write in Urdu these kind of Iran-centric accounts of Persian poetry, which followed their Iranian counterparts in disparaging the Persian poetry of, of, of India. Azad's Tazkir and Negaristani Fars was published posthumously, didn't receive a lot of attention, uh, but Sharu Ajam, Poetry of the Persians, um, was extremely influential, circulated very widely, including in Afghanistan and Iran, and later would be translated uh, into Persian uh, twice, first in Afghanistan, and then a new translation in Iran, uh, which is a significant thing uh, of itself. This is 1,500 pages. It's not a small work to translate twice. Um, so Sheryl Ajam is published between 1908 and 1918 in installments, uh, and it consistently draws from Majmar al-Fusaha, Hedayat's um, Tazkirah, as a source. Uh, but what Shibli is doing in this text is more innovative uh, in several regards. He gives a little bit more attention to uh, pre-Islamic uh, languages. I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. I'll say a bit more of that in a minute. Um, but really, more importantly, he really bridges the gap between Tazkide and literary history in terms of historiography and prose. So in the first three volumes, as I mentioned, it's published in installments. In the first three volumes, he's... he's um, Again, structured in the, tr in the traditional way, here's an entry for this poet, separately here's an entry for that poet, but he's introducing elements of literary criticism and historical criticism uh, into how he's dealing with these poets. But by the time he gets to the fourth and fifth volumes, he's writing narrative prose. And so he's, there's really like now a sense of a single linear historical time that is actually connecting these poets, that you're not just talking about an individual poet on their own merits, but thinking about them historically as participating somewhere in a tradition, building on or engaged with those who have come before them, or, and, and then you know, going to influence uh, those who will come after them. Uh, and he's one of the first to write at length uh, again, this is an Indian Muslim, um, to write at length about the importance of the Shahnameh as a historiographic source. And he dedicates several sections to reading the Shahnameh as history, praising Ferdowsi as a historian. Uh, of course, treating the Shahnameh as history is not something new in and of itself, but what he understands history to be, and then identifying that in the Shahnameh is something new. Um, I could say more about that uh, in the Q&A if there's interest. Um, now, again, um, this is a, a text that favors Iranian poets, um, and in this he, he really kind of uh, differs with uh, Edward Brown's literary history of, of Persia, which is really being published uh, right at the same time, and the two are engaged with one another. Uh, Shibli reads and cites a volume of Brown, Brown reads and cites a volume of Shibli, and um, it's kind of unfolding simultaneously. Um, but Brown has a, has a, uh, you know, a nationalist framework um, of continuity from pre-Islamic into Islamic uh, Iran, I and mean, much of the first volume of his literary history of Persia is all about pre-Islamic uh, literature. Um, but for Shibli, 
Pers the Persian language begins with Islam, and Persian literature begins with Islam. And he contests Brown directly, argues that um, poetry cannot predate uh, Islam in Iran. He says, European researchers have found a great many Middle Persian books, but they did not turn up even four lines of poetry. And so he argues that what the Orientalists identify as pre-Islamic Persian poetry is just rhymed prose, uh, nasr muzum. Uh, and in fact, according to Shibli, not only poetry, but the new Persian language itself begins with Persians' encounter with Arabic. He says, gradually, as Persian and Arabic mixed, like Urdu, a new language was born, and one would say it was a particularly Islamic language. Uh, and in fact, there's very similar trajectories. You can make an argument, at least I would make the argument, um, that there's very similar trajectories between uh, Persian and Urdu in kind of gaining a new identity through the interaction with, uh, with Arabic. Azad gives uh, a very similar account. I won't, I won't get into the details. I'll try to move uh, a bit forward. Um, but these two Urdu language histories of Persian literature are, are interesting in that they, they accept and incorporate some of these aspects of Iranian nationalism, such as Iranian claims to the Persian literary heritage. So again, Persian literature, this is Iranian literature, and this is something that properly belongs to the Iranians, even as they contest other aspects of uh, what is emerging as, as kind of Iranian nationalism, um, such as the antipathy to, um, to Arabic and Islam, um, which is at odds with the way that, of course, Muslim identity is being configured at the time in South Asia. Um, so I'm, I'm moving to the last, uh, last section here, um, and I wanted to also emphasize, you know, I've been talking about Iranian nationalism, but I think it's important to emphasize how uh, inchoate and, and contingent it really is uh, in, this, in this period, including those uh, anti-Arab elements. Um, so let me turn to um, Mohammed uh, Hossein Fourouri, um, whom I mentioned earlier. And he's someone who I think really complicates. This is his uh, literary history of, of Persian, which I'll, I'll come to. Um, Fourouli is someone who I really think complicates any kind of simplistic binary between um, the traditionalist uh, ulama that's educated in Arabic and, and um, you know, has this relationship with Arabic. And then, uh, so that on the one hand, on the one side, and then on the other side, you have the modernizers. You have your Akhunzades and Karamanis. Um, who are uh, ideologically kind of anti-Arab. Um, Mohammed Hossein Fourouri, Zokol Mulk, his, his title, and his son, uh, Mohammed Ali Fourouri, inherits the title as well, um, had also significant connections with Indians. Uh, Indian connections ran in the family, actually. The patriarch, Mohammed Mahdi Arbab Esfahani, had been involved with commerce and publishing uh, in India. Um, and he regaled um, you know, the, the younger members of the family with his tales of, uh, of, of years spent working in Bombay. Uh, and of course, um, Mohammed Hossein Fourouri met with uh, Mohammed Hossein Azad during his trip to, um, to India. Um, and he, he writes this literary history of Persian, which his son, Mohammed Ali Fourouri, edits. And again, the son also has these significant um, sort of Indian connections. He spent time in India. He surrounded himself with Indian, uh, again, including Indian Muslim uh, friends and acquaintances. Um, he, uh, both in India uh, and in Iran, and actually in Paris as well, during the Paris Peace Conference, um, he's, he's kind of um, keeping up with some of these um, Indian Muslim uh, activists. Uh, including um, Sayyid Suleiman Nadvi, who's the protege of Shibli Numani, about whom I was speaking, the um, literary historian. So Fourouri then writes a literary history of Persian, uh, which is a kind of, uh, it's a kind of josve, it's a pamphlet for teaching in his, uh, in his courses uh, that is then edited by his son, and, and they produce a lithograph uh, in 1917. And in this literary history, rather than identifying an antagonistic relationship between Persian and Arabic, Fourouri takes a composite view of Persian, actually a view that's very similar to how these Urdu speakers were viewing their languages, something that it has, you know, it, uh, the Arabic element is not 
something against which the language is being defined. It's actually a constitutive element of the language in the first place. It's part of what makes the language and the literature what it is. Um, so he describes Persian as a mixture or combination of Parsi and Arabic words. He says, quote, uh, in the end, we got a new language which was neither pure Arabic, Arabi Khales, nor pure Persian, Farsi Yekdast. Uh, and later, he, he, he does make a distinction between, you know, Arabic lexical items and, and Persian grammar. He's, he's someone who's not above boasting that uh, Ferdowsi Shahname is superior to any Arabic divan. Um, so again, he's, uh, he's, he's not uh, a totally, um, not a figure you can really fit neatly into one of these sort of different, uh, different camps. But the narrative that he offers of Persian as a mixed language that is greater than the sum of its parts, it is enriched by its uh, interaction with Arabic, uh, is something that, that's kind of unique. Um, this composite view of Persian, of course, as we know, did not become hegemonic. Uh, he represents here, I think, an unrealized alternative. His literary history never made it to print. Uh, that, that lithograph from 1917 didn't circulate. It, it, um, wasn't widely reproduced. Uh, and so I'll conclude here by raising a few possibilities. Could it be that this text did not endure because of its approach, which contradicted uh, the narrative of Persian opposition to Arabic uh, that would later come to really characterize Iranian nationalism and, and, and come to dominance uh, later under the Pahlavis? Or is it that that hegemony, the hegemony of that narrative, remained unchallenged because a work like this didn't circulate, didn't have a chance to, to find greater purchase, and instead was confined to gather dust in, uh, in the National Library. Um, and might it be the case, again, I would suggest yes, uh, that Fourouri and his contemporaries were influenced by their Indian interlocutors in how they were conceiving of Persian. Again, his conception of Persian being so similar to um, how his Indian Muslim interlocutors thought about their language, Urdu. In any case, uh, a marginal text like this one reveals how one particular idea of Iran was not yet fixed in the Bajar period, but instead it was something protean, in flux, uh, which points to the contingency of those ideas that would later gain dominance. Thank you. Welcome to the session. Iran as a trading partner. We are going to discuss um, Qajar's economy in the light of commercial relations with the British and Russian networks, and also the very intricate and complex relation interactions between state and merchants. So uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker, William Jenkins, uh, who is an independent researcher and scholar. As government advisory, he conducts integrity and dispute investigations, evidence gathering and political risk assignments. He formerly worked in Dubai on Iran trade and as a director for firms in London. William trained as an historian and economist and he received his graduate degrees in global economic history from the University of Leipzig in Germany and the London School of Economics. Um, his talk is about tariffs, treats, treaties and trade in Qajar Persia economy and commercial integration under 19th century global condition. The floor is yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for the, for the nice welcome and uh, to start a special thank you to the hosts for inviting me and a special thank you um, to Charles for finding me and inviting me particularly. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here and present this research which um, was work of some time um, and uh, it, it, it is it, within a broader frame um, in this uh, particular presentation I'm going to focus on the um, Russian Iranian trade, so the Tsarist Qajar trade, which is the lesser study. So uh, the British trade, we have, uh, there's been a lot of secondary literature already produced on that. Um, we have a clear idea of it. Uh, to briefly summarize it, it's something that already sits within uh, kind of the 19th century global condition, if we can call it that. So essentially, 
uh, globalization as it existed um, in, in the 19th century. So few regions of the world economy escaped colonization by European powers, which really was the instrument ne plus ultra of 19th century globalization. Uh, core European economies industrialized and experienced modern economic growth as the nation state consolidated. Uh, great material wealth strengthened fiscal military states to propel European power around the globe. Colonization directly and forcefully integrated far-flung regions into a 19th century globalization. But the expansion of trade and the market meant that regions globalized to differing degrees through falling transportation costs and improved communication, among other things. This weighed heavily on the gains from trade realized by regional economies operating and interacting within a global economy. Persia, itself an erstwhile empire with a tradition of statehood, remained uncolonized, but became increasingly subject to the vagaries of the global market as well. The idea in recent scholarship that integration into the world economy occurred in uneven and historically contingent ways in different parts of the world has thrown the ideal type of colonial expansion into stark relief. Regions that avoided direct colonization in certain ways, such as Pajar Persia, or fiscal military imperial states that lagged industrially or financially on the edge of Europe, such as Tsarist Russia, provide a valuable foil to understanding the complex historical contingency of 19th century globalization. While British and Russian colonialists coveted and rebuffed Persia, the market drew her into its fold in varying ways, not least through exposure to British and Russian commerce. However, the Iranian economy, state and society were both globalized and deglobalized and had their own agency through the actions of Persian merchants, especially in this case. Together, the Persian economy's relations with Russian commerce and industry provide a challenge to the ideal type of 19th century globalization and market integration, and the two re as the two regions work differently in their own specific uh, interplay at the periphery of the global economy and as its metropole, and furnish a new interesting case for seeing how ir the Iranian economy developed. So the two key questions that I focus on here are how, when, and on what terms did markets of trade integrate between Persia and Russia uh, in the 19th century? And then also, what, are the, what were the trade dynamics and what do they say about uh, the extent of globalization and the integration of the Iranian economy and how it developed in itself in the 19th century, especially in light of dependent development and economic penetration narratives, which may well be familiar to you from various authors who I will also visit. So to give some background on that, uh, there is certainly a reductionism, especially focusing on the economy of Iran and what is said about it uh, in this period. So they are rather laden with kind of the um, political history and diplomatic history. Um, and this is often extrapolated to, to tell us what the economy actually did. Once we start looking actually what happened, uh, it quite turns out to be the opposite, um, especially in the Russian Russian uh, Persian connection. As I said, the British, the British uh, kind of the development of the Persian Gulf was quite a different thing and much more tied into the then global economy. So some of the things to keep an eye on are kind of the, the geopoliticking uh, in of imperialism um, and how that was projected, um, militarism, and also the uh, kind of state centrism. So it's, it's a hard thing always to escape it. Um, we have to work with the data that we have, and um, I'll be uh, showing you some of that shortly. Um, but the, there, there, there is something that is very reifying about the state, and we need to uh, pull apart various parts of how both the Tsarist state and the Pajar state actually worked, especially as, as they were able to penetrate commercial society, the Tojar, and various other commercial institutions. So I also apply kind of empire, uh, various theories of empire and territoriality um, to look at, for instance, the commercial annex of uh, the Treaty of Turkman Chai, um, whether there really was a surrendering of sovereignty, how the trade networks uh, worked in practice, um, the, the lag of nation building in various aspects, particularly financialization, uh, which is usually seen as starting later but um, warehousing, various practices like this, migration um, and commercial policy, also institutions like um, the commercial courts that were imposed, how they compare to the Ottoman and Egyptian cases, which are, again, much 
more studied and better known. Um, and then also uh, the terms of trade, which is what I largely work with in the data that I've gathered, which is a, a new, newish data set I've gathered. I'll go into where it comes from, how it was collected. Um, and it has a very stark picture for us that goes against what has mostly been said. So essentially it comes down to what are the actual historical trade figures that are available to us and what do they tell us. So just briefly also as, as background, as a quick summary, Cosm's are this work of course is important. Um, I may caricature a little bit, but the lack of agency for Iranians is something that bothered me in reading it. Um, Amir Ahmad is a, a, a big work um, with the defining story being imperialism uh, and making Persia dependent. Certainly there's lots of that in various spheres of, of history. It's not something that I saw in the data here. Atovaki um, particularly focuses on mil militarism um, around the treaties. Um, one of the particularly interesting works of, is of course um, Muhammad Ali Jamal Zadeh's uh, Ganja Shoyagon, uh, which looks at Persian trade as probably the most kind of dedicated slightly later um, work to look at it from within Iran. And uh, there is a particular quote from Jamal Zadeh that I think is, it being published in 1917, it is the first Persian work that we have on Iranian commerce uh, on the, in the 19th century um, the, of that comprehensiveness. And he says, uh, if Persia's trade in the 19th century was divided into eight parts, Russia would account for four and a half of that and Britain two and a half. So again, this is closer to the, um, again, not entirely contemporary to the 19th century. I'm looking at it in a long, long durée perspective. Um, but there is, there is uh, all the evidence certainly weighs on the volume of trade uh, being much more on the north. Um, certainly a lot of the activity of the Iranian merchants was, was far more oriented that direction. Um, I'd be happy to do more questions on the British uh, and the southern, southern side of trade um, separately. Um, indeed, much of the insight that Persian exports fared well in terms of the uh, terms of trade against uh, Russian exports derives from the fact that, that society, or certain strata of it, were actually quite commercially capable in Iran in a period of historic state incapacity in Persia. But that was also true in Russia. So we have uh, Jamos over there and a few other things, but just some quotes to illustrate the um, general view. So, uh, without going too much into cleometry and economic history, some of the concepts that are important, obviously globalization, that's familiar. Market integration is a formal measure, um, which is the convergent, price convergence and the law of one price. Um, the distinction between uh, non-competing goods and substitutable goods does matter in, re in um, looking at this. But really what I'm going to look at is the terms of trade, the balance of trade, balance of payments and uh, then look for reasons why they were this way, which is not least transaction costs and um, various different aspects of the, the, the strength and the, the robust uh, Persian commercial um, class that uh, continued onwards from the early modern era. So um, I essentially apply a simple quantitative uh, and graphical analysis and then do a qualitative uh, assessment of it through uh, some of the excellent social history in particular that has uh, come out in recent years, not least Willem Flores that has reconstructed uh, very interesting things around labour and guilds um, and a lot of the very granular commercial practices that predominated in Qajar Iran. So there is of course the issue of the absence or patchiness of documentation and data and um, the low base and general neglect that you have to start with which uh, brings about the simple quantitative method for this. So analysis of market integration and commerce in 19th century Persia and to a lesser extent Russia, do, it has all sorts of pitfalls. Um, the Iranian government did not keep consistent data on revenues and expenditures until the 1920s, didn't have a dedicated budget for the most part except for the Shah's uh, court funds with some exceptions until 1911 and systematic records of customs began in 1901 only. Uh, by contrast, extensive Russian customs statistics exist. Um, they sit in St. Petersburg and Tbilisi, uh, where I did go to collect some of this data, though largely unretrieved in those places. They have been seen by certain people um, and published uh, to a tangential extent in certain places. So it's a com combination of various things. Um, this also combines a number of primary accounts um, 
that are really at an individual or a, a particular kind of trading network level. So formal testing of the market integration by price convergence is not something that we're quite at the stage to do yet, but uh, hopefully that might become possible. So some of the key findings. Given the rudimentary historical data and the state of the historiography, uh, these simpler techniques of estimating terms of trade and the balance of trade go a long way to elucidate the reality of 19th century Russo-Persian trade. Most importantly, Russo-Persian commerce in the 1800s, in the first era of globalization, reflects the persistence of early modern commercial dynamics and practices. The process of globalization and market integration was constrained by very practical difficulties for the historical actors who pursued commerce. Traversing tough terrain, negotiating and enforcing commercial contracts, uh, ensuring supply of goods, and navigating fraught political dynamics at home and abroad created significant transport and communication costs. These were exacerbated by lack of capital and infrastructure. In the Russo-Persian commerce of the 1800s, this effectively prolonged the operation of the early robust early modern trade networks in the face of modern models, uh, modern being at that stage seen as the Western European, uh, which Russia also had not adopted for the most part and was not able to until much later. Um, in this, uh, and so I, I argue that the transaction costs, volume, composition, and practices of Russian Russo-Persian trade indicate that it remained basically of early modern. That the importantly, the terms of trade distinctly favoured Persia in its trade with Russia throughout the 1800s, and that this imbalance runs contrary to the prevailing historiographical consensus um, of imperial domination of Persian commerce, and this is the emphasis on commerce particularly, in that it's taken trans-historically and projected as dependent development and economic penetration based on counterfactual readings of documentation such as the Treaty of Turkmenchai in 1828, and especially its commercial annex, as well as other applications of policy documents that don't reflect the reality. The um, Persian advantage in the terms of trade during the 1800s and its neglect resulted from a combination of fundamentally economic actors, uh, factors. These were the comparative advantage of early modern Persian merchant networks vis-a-vis -vis Russian merchant, merchants, Russian industrial and financial underdevelopment, especially in, with regard to Persia, um, Cyrus and Hajar's state incapacity to induce and regulate commercial relations also. So there was a, uh, the transition to modern trade occurred late in the Russo-Persian connection. There was a positive balance of trade in Persia's favour until at least the 1890s, possibly the early 1900s. Um, and I, can go into the, I will go into the specifics of that. So the terms, composition and dynamics of trade constructed from primary sources, especially the Russian customs receipts, uh, of which there are copies in Tbilisi, show that the robust, robust continuity of early modern trade and commercial practices and institutions favoured Persia and not Russia in the 1800s, that Russo-Persian commercial interactions reveal the agency of real historical merchants and Cyrus and Pajara state incapacity, and the, um, uh, to, 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 to try and establish the historicity of, of, of what was happening. So in short, the, the, um, the lagging Russian metropole in its, in its, in its uh, trading practices, its, its, its commercial institutions, and particularly also the prohibitive trans transaction costs of trading with Persia, especially across the Caucasus, um, were, were operative here. So there is, there's a lot made of the Russian state's um, ability to impose certain rules within Persia, and this comes to the extraterritoriality. But in fact, it turns out uh, that in certain ways, they had, uh, there was quite a lot of powerlessness in, in, in commercial activities, and that the, uh, the state incapacity ruled the day in many ways on both sides. So this, this um, uh, is, is, again, not uh, the military and political and diplomatic uh, differences in power, uh, something that we just need to be careful about um, translating into commerce and the economy. Um, so I'll present now a couple of uh, graphical representations of Russo-Persian trade. Uh, these sketch the secular increase in trade volumes, the terms of trade, and the changing compositions of expert versus, export versus import across the period. Um, the key sources here de deployed are um, uh, show, show that the uh, trade increased 12-fold across the period in real terms, uh, which was less than, for instance, the uh, regionally leading economies, uh, as, as is put in the traditional economic history literature of the Middle East, 
where Egypt increased 42-fold and the Ottoman Empire uh, 20-fold. Again, very different situations. Um, uh, tied into the glo global economy in quite a different way, in a much more similar way to the south of Iran. Um, and the, uh, the real historical trade would have exceeded the trade captured in these representations and primary sources um, by a significant amount, and I'll come back to this, um, probably double. Um, and, but it is also quite clear that that unaccounted for part also uh, would, th th there's everything to suggest that the bias would actually, again, increase the, uh, the uh, Persia's terms of trade uh, over Russia. So, if anything, this is an underestimation to the, to the extent that I can tell. Uh, so, account and gold rubles uh, in the customs receipts were used concurrently to settle the balance of payments with Persia. Assignat rubles were phased out with financial reforms in 1839 and withdrawn from circulation in Russia by 1843. Um, these were replaced by silver in account until 1896. Um, upon Russia's conversion to the gold standard. Um, it might be a, a wider um, observation might be that uh, Persia and Iran historically through history were gold, uh, silver sinks um, and this, this, this is also reflected in this period. So being historical data there are numerous grounds for misestimation and non-capture, um, unreported trade traffic, smuggling um, of which there are some very interesting stories um, in, in, in primary sources. And, uh, but also over-reporting of value, remittances, uh, things that we might call trade-based money laundering, for instance, now. Um, these are very, and yet these various figures present a pretty consistent picture uh, from various, various data sets. So, um, this graph tracks the movements of total trade volume from the different data sets in the, uh, that we have available in rubles, um, except for Ricardo, which is a, a data set that was constructed uh, to cover the global economy uh, through history. Um, so series A, uh, which is the uh, blue line, um, depicts the Russian customs receipts uh, for the whole period. It shows a significant drop off in volumes from 1830, that being uh, 38.4 million rubles to 1834. Um, this, of course, being the Turkmen Chai era. I'll come back to the, the various kind of correlations and historical events that, that, that show some of these, these changes. Um, in 1834, it hit 11 million, approximately. It picked back up to 19 million in 1838. Um, again, a British treaty changed the, created an even playing field, as you might call it, in certain or uh, a non non favoured nation status, uh, and a relatively consistent slow increase to hit the same high level over uh, 19 million ruble only 40 years later, which was 1878. So, uh, the uh, Frederico Tanner World Trade Database, another interesting data set, um, claims to show Persia's total trade, and this is series B, the orange lines, um, but only consults English and Russian records back to 1901. And then uh, before that, it extrapolates back to 1850. Um, so uh, uh, instead of using data that is available, um, it does seem to severely underestimate Persia's total trade again, um, based on the, the extrapolation from 1901 back to 1850. Um, the Ricardo estimates, uh, which is series C and D, so that's the yellow and grey, um, are based on English and French statistical records but concern only Perso-Russian trade. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting collect tangential collection of data there. So starting in 1833, they contain gaps in 1850, 1863 to 1871, 1874 to 1883, and 1889. Uh, but Ricardo does mirror the volume and fluctuations of the Russian customs receipts in the years that we have. So looking at uh, this and the next slides show 1830 to 1896 uh, and 1900 Russo-Persian trade returns from the customs receipts. Um, orange being uh, Russia, um, so to Persia. Um, and blue being from Persia. You can see certainly the balance there over the course of the period. Um, I think graphically uh, represented in both of these roughly 70 year time frames, the balance of trade was just simply in Persia's favour, despite the terms stipulated by Turkmen Chai, um, that in theory and by most historical accounts yielded Persia's markets to Russian commerce. The pre existing trade around 1830 and its decline may be attributable to a Turkmen Chai balance. Um, I believe it more likely results from trade diversion from the Caucasus and Batum Tabriz, or the Trabzon Tabriz trade routes, 
during and after the 1826-29 Russo-Persian Russo-Turkish War. Other than 1832, 1890, 91, and 1894, at no time did Russia's exports to Persia exceed their imports in account rubles. Russian exports uh, exceed their imports in gold for only one year, which is 1900, and even then only barely. Uh, again, we see the fluctuations here. Um, they appear, so there are, there are certain fluctuations here that appear more clearly in the assignat rubles, uh, but again, they don't appear in silver or gold. This one, uh, this depicts the per Russo-Persian trade volume from the Ricardo project, uh, which misses years. Um, beginning in 1833, the original Sterling series does not capture the early volatility of the Russian customs receipts. But once converted to rubles on current exchange rates, it does. This is presumably due to the deflator effect, uh, which nullifies the, the inflation. So some of those fluctuations are essentially inflation. There's, there's no actual trade uh, fluctuation there. Um, but it does show that uh, cons consistent lower Russian exports to Iran um, than the Russian customs receipts, um, even though the terms of average on uh, terms of trade are slightly higher. So uh, this displays the inverse Russo-Persian terms of trade. Um, you'll see across the period up until the very end, uh, they barely cross over um, with quite some uh, distance between them uh, in throughout most of the century. Um, I won't go into the specific uh, ratios of this, um, but again, I think the, the graphical representation shows how, how distinct that is. So uh, the variation is especially remarkable in some periods. Um, the largest variation occurred in the mid 1840s. Uh, this may be somewhat attributed to the increasing flow of British and other European goods in the re-export trade to Russia, of which there's plenty of uh, interesting uh, particular evidence, uh, less quantitative, uh, but certainly can be stacked up to, to have been a major dynamic. Um, and this was after the 1841 agreement where British, British tariffs were equalized with uh, the Russian tariffs um, in Turkmen Choi, after Turkmen Choi, and um, the lower transport and uh, communication costs in the south. So uh, there are other Russian considerations here. There are dips that loosely coincided with major historical events like the 1870-72 Persian famine, uh, which was attributed to various things. Uh, the results of which is great spurt as finance minister in, in Russia as well. Um, but nonetheless, uh, Persia's terms of trade with Russia never again exceeded 300 on the index, uh, which after eight, the 18th, early 1840s. So the terms of trade data clearly does not support the view of the 1800s as a lost century of economic penetration in the uh, Russo-Persian link. Uh, Persia did depend on Russia, but not in the subjugated political economic sense suggested by most authors in, in their commercial relation. Russia certainly loomed large as the top export market for Persia's produce, manufactures and re-export. Continuations of early modern proto-industry, in which Iran uh, in many ways was more developed than Russia uh, through most of this period and more specialised. Um, did have an impact, um, and uh, the access to markets is the other key thing. So Otto Blau, who wrote in 1858 an economic survey of Iran, um, spoke about, for instance, the Schmuggelhand, which is the, uh, the smuggling dynamics. Um, the most insightful Russian authorities in Persia itself admit that these figures inscribed, that being the Russian customs receipts, inscribed barely half of the real turnover of Russo-Persian trade. So this is a contemporary account. Um, from someone who had many, many months to go and gather data and speak to people, um, and therefore came closer to the truth uh, that we should probably double the Russian calculations. Um, Blau's figures uh, cover 52 to 57, uh, largely tally with the customs receipts, and uh, based also on other primary sources, uh, he noted that Russian merchants he met, for instance, in Tabriz, uh, and other observers reported a net flow of currency to Persia of between five and seven uh, million rubles um, above customs in each year. Um, so that's the underestimation again. Composition of trade is interesting. It changes over the, over the course of the century, and this is where the market in integration comes in, of course, with the British uh, running opium out of the south. That was a cash crop. It tells us a whole lot more about uh, integration into the global economy. In, in, in the Russian... 
connection. There were all sorts of, there was a different set of the composition of trade in that silk, of course, luxury goods, early, more commonly traded early modern goods, dominated for most of the century. And they became bulk goods and kind of substitutable goods later on. Um, so, again, this tells an interesting story, but it's kind of into the, into the uh, changing dynamics in a more granular way at different times during the, the, the 19th century. Um, metal and metalware, you know, all the, all the various products we do have quite a, can uh, both reconstruct and have already quite a clear picture of this. So to go into why, briefly, in my last few minutes, um, essentially Russian merchants faced considerable obstacles in their commerce with Persia. Um, transaction costs were just very high. What surmounted this for the Persian merchants was the set of robust uh, early modern trade networks. Um, they continued to operate across a high transaction cost um, terrain, uh, both uh, human and uh, physical geography. Um, and uh, this, this is really the key dynamic that I, that, that I, I find explains uh, the stark data. So, the abilities of the Persian traders and robust early modern mercantile institutions, practices and networks surmounted these better, uh, evident in the dominance of export by Persia and even quasi-monopoly on import of Russian products, um, which was no end of frustration for Russian traders. Um, Entner uh, has a great article on this uh, from the 60s, uh, which is one of the few that really looked at this in, in, in detail. Um, and he describes those who actually plied the trade as failures, fools, fly-by-nighters, gamblers, Caucasians, and Persians, which uh, was a fr constant frustration for those on the other side. Um, the second section uh, that, I, that I go into in the paper uh, qualitatively assesses the robustness and the, the comparative advantage of the uh, mercantile institutions and practices, and it really does underline the historical reasons for the persistence of the Persian networks. Uh, and their, their relative dominance until the early 1900s. Um, and it specifies why the balance of trade weighed in Persia's favour. So two key dynamics from this uh, are the uh, certain of the Persian commercial pr practices, especially the Kar Gozar, um, the Saraf, the Dalal, and the Tojar, but especially the Tojar uh, Bozor, um, who uh, occupied a particular <coughs> class uh, position and had access to finance that was not available to others and deployed it in interesting ways. The underdevelopment also of the Russian institutions of trade finance and ineffectual or deprioritized state support of trade uh, to Persia as opposed to other markets they accessed also played a major role. Um, asserting the agency of Russian and Persian merchants in their historical context uh, allows us to escape the regular and regularly erroneous simple conflation of Russo-Persian commerce with state actions. Under, uh, examining the uneven effects of diplomatic treaties and customs arrangements on historical commerce gives us a better guide to market integration than the policy analysis that has preoccupied historians on this matter for the most part. Cyrus Russia's demonstrable fiscal military uh, strength had varying effects on commerce. Russian merchants relied on state support that was not, for the most part, forthcoming. Primary sources conf confirm that non-Russians predominated the trade, as regularly bemoaned by Russian officials as well as Russian traders who were outcompeted. For instance, in his 1895 visit to Persia, Alexei Kuropatkin um, was dismayed to find all traders of Russian goods he met, met were Persian or Caucasian. Um, Russia and Persia were both peripheral economies, importantly in the, in the 19th century um, global economy, um, and this, this ha plays a large role in the nature of their interactions, but especially the difference with the trade in the South and how they were integrated into the 19th century globalization. Um, Isawi's work uh, is, of course, uh, some of the most extensive, comprehensive, interesting, and detailed. Um, but his com comparison in this, in this quote of the two puts them essentially on, a, on an equal level as far as economic development with various different um, uh, caveats, such as the uh, sophistication of Persian handicrafts, uh, which were less bulk good. Um, they were largely agricultural, of course, the surf land tenure relations were relatively similar as well. Uh, there was a major specie shortage uh, so of currency within Iran throughout periods of uh, the various parts of the Qajar period. Um, and this, this, again, kind of was surmounted by various other practices, barter with currency or without currency, but also trust-based accounting and uh, contracting mechanisms. 
um, which uh, uh, did um, un underpin the way that the Persian commerce uh, came out so well. Um, the structure of the companies, of course, mattered. Um, the, Persian, the, the Russian trading houses uh, attempted warehousing on all sorts of interesting kind of stories of that along the Caspian, uh, which were regularly empty, um, and they're outmaneuvered often in commercial ports, which were some of which were established under Turkmenchai, uh, many of which actually operated under the Kargozar um, in practice when, when disputes did arise. So the assumption of Russian capital access and its deployment in the Persian trade also uh, is, is something that is assumed from the idea of um, uh, access to increasing financialization by Western European powers, but I would say Russia was not one of those. Um, there was also, I mean, Turkmen Chai had its various different provisions. I didn't, don't need to go further into that. That's, that's all well known. The, um, uh, equalization of the tariff rates between Britain and Russia also tell us an interesting story of how the penetration, if we can call it that, into the Iranian economy actually did work. Um, and uh, the re-export also is something we should not forget. So if Russian traders operated above Persian law, um, in theory, in practice, uh, Iranian traders more easily operated around it um, through a range of informal institutions which included personal exchange and other informal contractual mechanisms. So the Tujar especially were important in this. Uh, Tujar et Bozor, they did not form guilds, um, unlike smaller traders. Um, and this, this changed the access to finance and the closeness of the economy to competition, if we put it in those current terms. Um, and they cross-funded each other by amortization and personal liability. Um, they operated in different trades, uh, but also conducted wholesale. Um, and interestingly, smaller merchants often operated on behalf of the larger merchants. And this again goes back to the personal exchange and the different informal contractual mechanisms that um, there was as much collaboration as there was competition. Um, and this again supported the Persian trade networks as opposed to the uh, haphazard Russian application of what they thought were West, superior Western European uh, trading mechanisms. So finally, um, the uh, 19th century Russo-Persian trade was not the story of economic penetration by Russia particularly, nor of capitulation to Tsarist imperialism. Uh, the new data gathered and reconstructed tells this quite clearly. Um, there are all sorts of reasons for it which uh, come out in some of the excellent social history that's been done in recent years. Um, the, it very much balanced distinctly in Persia's favour, uh, even as the volume of trade increased over the century and the um, high transaction costs remained high through most of the period, falling by the end of it. The Persian institutions certainly were better suited to that and the lack of capital, um, the mixed implementation of Western European uh, trading practices and um, the uh, continuous trade nonetheless uh, carried through the century and um, only changed by the early 1900s.